All right, Dan Cochimilio along with Los D. Here we are talking Niner football and the fallout after the Niners choke at SoFi yesterday, Los. Uh, tough, tough loss in many ways. Javon Hargrave has now out for the season with a torn tricep. And the Niners are not only facing the injury bug, but the tough game of losing another 10-point lead in the fourth quarter in L.A. What do you got to say about that? Seems to be a ritual every few years that that's going to happen. And I think Kyle's uh, number two on the list behind John Harbaugh for coaches um, that haven't given up a 10-point lead or or it was a two touchdown lead, something like that, um, in the fourth quarter. So it was a disturbing game. Mondays, Mondays, the fan base is uh, usually ecstatic or upset, and they're very upset from what I've seen, heard on the radio, seen in social media. They're extremely upset at this one for many different reasons, and uh, we'll talk about a few of them today. Yeah, I mean, what what's what do you think's a bigger loss, them losing yesterday or losing Hargrave for the season? I think the way they lost was really disturbing. Hargrave has not played really that well since he's been here, to be quite frank. Don't get me wrong. He's a big name player. They pay him a lot of money, but has he really produced um, where he needed to? Now, he was banged up and hurt last year, so maybe we'll give him a little bit of a pass on that. But um, I think losing the way they did yesterday was, was very bothersome because it's one thing to give up a 10 point lead to Patrick Mahomes and the, and the Kansas city chiefs. It's another thing to give up a lead to a team that you are, even with your own injuries, that was a, that was a, not even a JV team. That was a freshman team. Yeah. Minus Puka Nakua and, uh, and uh, Cooper cup missing. And then the Rams were missing what one or two offensive linemen, three, like, three offensive linemen. And, you know, they, Stafford still had plenty of time to get things done, to throw a 50-yard pass deep down the field at uh, near the end of regulation to set up the uh, – what was that? They were down 24-17 at the time, right? Yeah. And all of the Niners – Niners had so many opportunities that, you know, to go, you know – it's like in baseball, you go one for 12 in runners with scoring position. You have all these chances. The Niners were like, oh, for four or five in, I mean, you had the drop ball by Ronnie Bell that wins the game for him. They basically just ice the clock, ice it down to the last seconds. A chip shot by Jake Moody wins it in regulation. Yep. Would have won it 27-24. Then you had the mixed kick by Jake Moody, which was another opportunity to put the game away at the end there. And then you had the ball near midfield at the end of the first half with the strip, the sack strip fumble. That would have been a field goal there. All they needed was another 20 yards there to get into decent field goal range. Uh, and then, just the blown opportunities. I, and I looked at that last play, Los, of the two-second, the kickoff. Uh, the ball that when they threw it to – I don't remember who the lineman was, 64. I, I'm not sure who that was, if that was a backup. Um, Brendel. Brendel's 64, isn't it? Was it? Maybe so. Brendel may have had the he, – he threw the last lateral pass. There was a guy in front of Ayuk. Who's number 25? I'm, I'm – Trying to remember uh, is that the backup running back, uh, Patrick Taylor? I it might have been. He had a clear shot. Hey, that that, that, a, that that play was 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 working. All it needed was Joe Starkey calling it. Yeah, and a, ba and a band to be on the field. Oh, Pony's got the ball. He's got it back to Patrick Taylor. The band is on the field. The Niners score. Oh man, I was thinking that as I was watching. I, was like, I oh, mean, man. Like, that that, was a, that, was a that, that last pass when they when they threw it to Brendel and and then he chucked it over. The there was nobody in front of twenty five, and if that's 
I, I'm not looking at the number. I'm, I'm assuming you're right. Probably Patrick Taylor. He had it. If if it, if he caught it in stride, it was touchdown. And as it was, he threw it behind him to Ayuk. Ayuk, had he caught it, it would have been a bang bang because 26, who's the one that ended up tackling him. I think if I caught it in stride, he might have been able to get past him because the angle. I was watching it on the the uh, YouTube. If you ever watch the YouTube highlights at the end of, uh, I was I was surprised there was still time on the clock because the announcers were saying, "Okay, this is well." It's only game. four second, five seconds left, and it, they only took three off on the field goal. I thought, yeah, that was that was a little odd. Um, yeah, because hope- you just figured that that was it. The game was over, but there was two yeah. seconds left and you never know. And that was, that was a hell of an attempt, a hell yeah. of an effort to make that happen. So, but that's, that's why I said, when you ask what's, what's, what's bigger, the, the loss or, or Hargrave. And it, it's a legitimate question, but it, it's just disturbing the way the Niners lose these, these type of games, how they lose these leads. And it's kind of a pattern. You know, me and you grew up in an era where we had a team and we had a coach that just piled on. That just like the game was yeah, over in the no third. Off. It was a game. The game was over in the third quarter. Yeah. You know? if, if they were up thirty to ten, that wasn't enough. They were going to score another touchdown and another touchdown. I don't know if it's a killer instinct thing or if it's an execution thing, but there's just there's a disturbing pattern that the Niners in the second half and specifically in the fourth quarter, their offense just kind of bogs down. And they just stop scoring. Sometimes they stop well, even getting first downs. Yeah, so. certain tendencies of the Niners just irritate me. I, I like, you know, Bill Walsh was such a perfectionist and had his team always prepared, ready, prepared. And you know, if Bill Walsh practiced a two-minute drill, why is that? not good enough for Kyle Shanahan. And I'm one of the I biggest, do not, one of my biggest pet peeves about him. I don't wow. understand it. I don't understand it. And I mean, not that they needed it yesterday, but still they needed it against Minnesota. Now you're one and two, you know, the Hargrave situation is disappointing. We did see some things out there, highlights on Twitter of him, you know, the last one of the last plays, the, the big 50 yard pass to Atwell, where he was just like, not even trying now we know now we know why now we know so i mean that's i mean guys normally don't put that on film for you know just to say hey i'm not gonna try this play he obviously was hurting must have hurt it just before that and or or otherwise he wouldn't have been i I don't think he would have taken the field with that i mean that would have been ridiculous and you know the thing the thing about the two-minute drill too dan is that you know, people just think that you need it at the end of the game or at the end of a half to, to to score quickly. But there are some offensive minds and some head coaches that just to change things up, yep, they'll, they'll start the game with a two minute drill because it doesn't sure. allow defenses to substitute. Exactly, it gets them tired. It gets them worn down. It gets them wow. We don't know what they're doing. What they're going so. Like well, if they're not, in a if yeah, they're in a base just, base package, you know, if they're right, in a base right. package, you know, why not keep those guys? Just move, move, move. Don and, Don Shula did that to Bill Walsh in the Super Bowl. They went yeah. no huddle in the in that first quarter, and you know they were just throwing every down. And like, yeah, Jack Hacksaw Reynolds in there. He is not a guy that you want in there. He's a run stuffer, and they couldn't substitute. Dolphins went down the field, yeah, and. You know, went ahead ten to seven. Guess what? Niners made adjustments and they put all they 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 played the whole game in in nickel and dime coverage. The rest of the game, they didn't even yeah. threaten, um, feel threatened by the running game. So, right, I don't yeah, understand yeah. that. Um, that's one of the things that I, I really don't understand. The second thing is special teams has consistently been a problem for the last six or seven years. So you think about special teams and it's more than just missing extra points or missing field goals. Think about it. It's a tie game. The Niners are punting. Why would you punt the ball down the middle of the field and give them an opportunity to even return a punt? Yeah, what was Take left? It like out of bounds. 30, 30 seconds left in the game. Why not? Yeah, just kick it out of kick bounds. Even out of bounds. They were out of timeouts, right? The Rams. 
or did they have one left? I believe they may have had one, but yeah. Are the chances a little bit more difficult if you're mm -hmm. 60 yards away from field goal range than if you're 10? Because right. that guy broke it. He broke containment and he got about a 40 yard return. Yeah. So that's just what I what I've heard from numerous sources that are at Niners practices every day is they don't spend a lot of time on special teams. They don't special practice teams, very when often. I, when I played football, it was always we did it every practice. And you have to. Whether it was, you know, usually at the end of practice we did it, but it was always – and the number one thing is the guy on the outside, he can't give up that lane. You yep. don't crash because the ball's in the middle and everybody crashes. You left that – your assignment you you broke containment you've got to have that and then let those other guys that are in the middle of the field make the make the tackle and if he gets outside there's got to be somebody there that's just that's rule number one that's 101 football i don't understand how there was nobody there um if you're gonna crash crash wider you know come out leave you gotta Oh boy, that was frustrating, especially watching the replay. But uh, so the Niners lose Hargrave for the year. CMC, my thought on CMC, and we now know he went to Germany to visit a specialist. Right. I was saying the last few weeks when they put him on, I don't think he's coming back till December. That's my my gut. Maybe he comes back sooner. Maybe he doesn't come back at all. I don't know. But Achilles tendonitis generally takes a few months to really heal. And how do you get? healing rest you stay off of it you don't you just let it heal you're gonna have to you know in, in my mind i i think the way to do it is you're either in some kind of walking boot or crutches and then you just have to do your cardio on a bicycle and do and you still can do your weight training you just got to keep weight off of that achilles we'll see what happens but uh you got you got that issue You've got a one and two record. You now have a, a not literally a, a giant size hole right in the middle of your defense. And then, and then you still have Greenlaw out probably another seven, eight weeks or more. Uh, Debo has a calf issue and calf, as we see, can sometimes lead to something a little bit more. Yeah, We have Kittle with a hamstring issues. Hamstring issues do not heal usually in a week or two. Sometimes they can linger. So it's it's a beat-up team. It's an older team. It's a slower team. Uh, it's a team that's played a lot of games the last four or five years. I've emphasized that a lot. So have the Chiefs. But the difference is, is the Chiefs, you know, they install a lot of young players to take pressure off of their older players. The Niners have a philosophy of kind of continuing to play their vets at, at maximum time and and don't incorporate the younger talent. Um, we're seeing it again with Campbell playing at linebacker. I said at the start of the season that I thought he was a, a deficiency in coverage. Uh, it was a reason why the Packers let him go. And now here he is starting uh, at outside linebacker for the Niners, and he got exposed again. I don't know why they don't. Curtis Robinson had a great um, camp, great yeah. camp to make the team. And they got the kid Tatum Bethune, but it's just not the Niners' way to trust the younger players. It's ironic, Dan, but they kind of are similar to another team that we cover on this channel that when it comes to vets versus young players, they like the smarter, I know the system vet over the younger, maybe more talented young player that is not given a chance unless they're yeah there. you know you mentioned that other team i just gotta throw this in there not to i didn't say them by name because yeah, I, I can't uh, they're they're my kryptonite <laughs> yeah uh they're uh yeah they're they're on the other side of the room if you want to see a peek what we're talking about that team <laughs> that poster that giants uh that team is i don't understand let me just but I don't know if it's a, something in the water that uh, in, in the Bay Area. You know, Steve Kerr doesn't like to play a lot of young guys either, although last yeah. year he, he finally did. But tonight the Giants are starting Mark Canna because of the platoon system. You know what his lifetime stats are against Eduardo Rodriguez? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> he's 0 for 16. Now, oh, you're going to put a guy in sense. who's a older veteran who's probably not part of the future with seven games, six games left, and you have an opportunity of playing one of your younger guys in a meaningless game, and you're going to throw out a guy who's probably not on the team next year who's got 0 for 16 because he's a righty. That's just whatever. I don't want to get in too much of that, but that's just – I saw that and I just chuckled. So, no wonder you're camped in fourth place for, for – Two straight years, but back to the Niners. This uh... let me let me stand on that topic a little bit, but transferring it over to Kyle. Let me ask you something about Kyle mm-hmm. as it relates to how we see Farhan. I know baseball and football are very very different sports, obviously, but is Kyle Shanahan an analytical guy? And if he is, what is the definition of analytics when it comes to football? Because it, when I when I say that, maybe I'm going to kind of give my answer to the question and then let you respond. Like, again, I think Kyle likes – he prefers a guy that knows his system or knows how the defense plays rather than the upside of a younger, faster, more dynamic player that maybe he might miss an assignment and, and maybe he might mess up one time. Mm-hmm. But he'll also give you that dynamic play where – he blitzes off the edge, hits the quarterback, creates a fumble and a turnover. I, I just think that he's more analytical from the standpoint of his roster and that he'd rather play veterans that like a Mark Canna, to use an analogy of, of Giants baseball. I don't know. What are your yeah, thoughts? I, I think Kyle, if you call it analytics, but he seems to be a creature of habit. You know, yeah, maybe playing, that's a better, better phrase for it. Playing the same guy. I mean, we all saw it last year. We all saw that Mason could run. He could at least spell McCaffrey. Uh, and, you know, if you don't want to give McCaffrey, I get it. You want him on the field. But how about 20% of the snaps instead of 99 or 100%? Yep. Now they're saying, you know, some of these doctors that are out on the, the Internet that are, um, you know, that will give injury status, they'll – they'll make comments, you know, oh, this guy's got a, an ACL. That's so much time or, or based on the, what happened, I think it's an ACL, you know, those kind of docs that you see on Twitter and stuff like that. Well, there was one doc I read about a week ago that said the type of injury that McCaffrey has is based because of overuse, overuse of the, uh, the tendon. And I thought to myself, wow, uh, you know, we could see it. It's kind of like, you know, we're talking baseball. We could see that Elliot Ramos had the tools to be a player and never given an opportunity. We could see that McCaffrey was being run into the ground last year, even playing in games that were blowouts. He left him in there and just kept handing him the ball to, to run out the clock. It's like, come on. Now you got to – he's – he's you know, there's only so much miles – in in certain body parts where you know McCaffrey has just run 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 yeah and you know how we get on the local media because they will not ask Bob Melvin and Farhan tough questions it's the same thing with the Niners other than Grant Cohn and Larry's actually uh Kruger's actually asked a couple of good questions he asked the offensive line coach what is it that you guys see about Brendel at center I loved it because it was it's a legitimate question, I would love Kyle to answer that question. And uh, and Larry asked specifically to Kyle last year: Is McCaffrey's on pace to have over 400 touches? Is it sustainable? And his answer was just very like brush him away, like yeah, he's our running back. He's going to be on the field as much as possible. Translation is yes, I'm going to keep him on the field no matter what, no matter what anybody else says. That, that yeah. is a problem that and it's come back to bite them as you just yep. said overuse and he was injured and banged up in the super bowl you know who knows if he fumbles or doesn't fumble if he's a little bit more healthy i, I can't call that but now we're not going to see him much at all if at all this year because of that overuse yeah you got so you got the issue with mccaffrey and you know now we we watch yesterday's game and we see that Juwan Jennings has the game of his life. He's probably the best receiver. If you really look at it, pound, 
pound for pound, just what he's able to do. It's uh, it's amazing that McCaffrey, I mean, not, not McCaffrey, but Jennings, you know, 11 catches, 175 yards, three touchdowns for fantasy owners. It was like 46 points, 46, 47 points, something like that. And oh, he was out uh, there and I didn't pick him up. Oh, wow. Yeah, I thought about it. I picked up somebody else. Uh, I told my son to try and trade for him last week because I said he. I think he's going to have a big game. I didn't expect what he had, but now that we see what Jennings can do, um, it makes you think. What was the urgency to sign Ayuk? I get having three great receivers is is wonderful, but you could have had Jennings, Debo, and you could have got a first and and maybe a another. Uh, or a second and a wide receiver for, um, for Ayuk. And, and what was and what was the urgency to draft Ricky Pearsall? Yeah, and as a first round pick, when you needed a center or you needed a right tackle, you drafted a receiver yeah, you, that, at best, was fourth string on this team. You yeah. can't have your first round pick being a fourth stringer, right? And and, what, stringer. and, and what's and, and what's disturbing about that is Jennings showed out on that Super Bowl. Yeah. It wasn't Ayuk. It wasn't Debo. If the Niners hold on and win that game, Jennings quite possibly could have been the MVP. Oh, he was the MVP. Game. He would have been. He threw a touchdown pass. He scored a touchdown. Yeah. Um, and we get all caught up into, you know, oh, 4-3 speed and vertical and this and that. Jennings doesn't have big speed, but he's a big body. He has great hands. He runs very great routes. And you just see his, his love for the game. The, the, you, you notice the guys that got paid, the guys that already got paid their money, how they're losing their emotions and affection for the game. They're just like robots right now. They're like, hey, I got my money. So it, it's quite disturbing that the Niners knew all along what they had in-house in Jennings, that he was a very good player that, quite frankly, may be underutilized because Kyle loves him some Debo and McCaffrey. And when those two guys are on the field together, they get 50 to 60% of the looks when they're maybe ignoring a guy like Jennings that I haven't seen Debo have maybe the game against Philly last year would be equivalent. At Philly, Debo was a monster. Yeah. I can't remember you having a game like Jennings just had yesterday. Yeah, I just wonder where the Niners are at mentally because um... – you know, Super Bowl the, Chief, the Chiefs real. are three and zero, oh, and they've they've won games. Not they haven't looked pretty in all the games, but they the difference is they know how to win. Yes. They know how to win, and the Niners, for whatever reason, uh, I mean, you can't lose that game yesterday. The way I mean, you just can't. It, it wasn't like they were playing. I mean, and you can't say, oh well, the it was a tough road game. No, you had 65% of the crowd was 49ers, you know? The Niners, to me, Dan, they, they, they kind of a little bit, when they're really going good, they remind me of Mike Tyson in his day. Like when Tyson is going well, he he, he almost beats you from the start of the bell, from, you know, just an intimidation point of view, and he goes right through you. But when Tyson had to get into fights, like Holyfield twice, and right. like some other fights, like, it, you know, the Niners, when they get into these tough games, like, it just doesn't seem like things go smoothly. Like, there's always a mistake somewhere, a holding, a crucial special teams fumble or a crucial pass interference call. They get a little tight, almost like they expect to be ahead 10, 14 points in every game and coast. And when it's not an easy game, and, you know, what is that attributed to? It could be a lot of different things. Not prepared for game situations, which I think is a big problem. We talked about not be, not uh, practicing two-minute drills. Um, I understand that Kyle doesn't um, let Purdy, who has a problem with a wet ball, he has problems with bad conditions, doesn't have the biggest of hands. I understand he was asked, do you practice with a wet ball? And he said no. So he doesn't practice that game situation. So there, there is something there. And it just seems to be coming out more and more when these tight games come about. Because when they win like they did week one against the Jets, it's kumbaya, the Niners are the best team in the league, they have the most talent, blah, 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 blah. But when we see the deficiencies that we've seen the last two weeks, and quite frankly, they've been out coached the last two weeks, let's just call it the way it is. Yeah. Then, it then, is they, yeah, then all these questions come out legitimately. Yeah. And um, 
What do you do at right tackle right now? I mean, McKivitz, we saw him get beat a few times pretty easily, just pushed around. There was other times he looked like he's pretty pretty good, but I don't know if I've ever seen a tackle stand straight up like a scarecrow blocking. <laughs> And you know what we're gonna think when we think of the scarecrow, right? I mean, he is—he's not even. His knees aren't bent in any position to move laterally. He just stands up, and if the guy goes around him, uh, he's not moving. I don't know if it's because he can't or what, but I—it's I, just really odd to me. Well, because the Niners have not addressed tackle um, in in quite a few drafts. They're forced with, okay, instead of like saying, let's just get rid of McKivitz, what are the solutions? Well, Pooney could maybe move out to right tackle and Burford could go back in at right guard. Would that be a solution? Uh, Nick Sakel is a big uh, lineman. He's Brock Purdy's best friend on the team. And, well, he was his roommate before he got married. Um, can he play tackle? Because I understand he can play all three positions. They have marginal guys, but... McKivitz is marginal himself. So if you can upgrade it just a little, would it hurt to try somebody out there? Yeah. Uh, Jalen Moore didn't do bad when he filled in for Trent Williams for yeah. a couple of games last year. I think he's serviceable, but you know, going over to right tackle from left tackle, I don't know if that's going to throw him off of his game. But uh, center and right tackle are a problem. They've, they've been a problem, and they haven't been addressed. And that, Also, that's... Niners have some cap room because they've – restructured all these contracts and pushed things down the road a little bit further. So they have cap room. Do they go out and try and replace Hargrave with a, um, you know, a, a, you know, a solid pro bowler type guy, or do they try and just go after somebody like a, uh, you know, remember they had DJ Jones. There. I love, I love that idea. I, DJ Jones is, is a solid, solid player, which they wouldn't have let him go. Boy, those those decisions, they let a lot of good players go. And the players that they brought in, I don't know, quite frankly, if they're better than them. I mean, starting... Hargrave, Hargrave seemed like a name because he had such a great season two, three years ago at Philadelphia, the year um, Philadelphia got to the Super Bowl, right? And um, that goes back to Losa's philosophy buy low, sell high. They, yeah. bought, they, bought, they high bought high on a, oh, career, they bought high. On a career year. They bought high and he had nowhere to go, but lower, yeah. and he did. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he really hasn't done the sacks. What did he get last year? How many sacks? Seven, like seven. seven. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's uh, the he. But he's not a great run defender. He's he's not. No. That's not his game. He's purely so, a pass rusher. So maybe that maybe the Forty ers actually improved there. Maybe. You know, you go out and you got Boza, you got Floyd, you got uh, Matos on the edges. Maybe you get somebody that can stuff the run and they don't have to worry about, you know, all you need from that defensive tackle position. You you need a guy that can fend off the tackle, the guards in the center, fend them off, stuff the run, and and on a passing play – you don't have to get deep in the backfield. You just got to get a yard or two in there. So if the if the edge guys push him up, that they push him into the defensive tackle, and that he's there to swallow him up. Not so much chase guys, but well, you know, well, by definition, they have a guy on the practice squad, an undrafted free agent named Evan Anderson. Yes, he, the, he, he's a big kid, and you know. He he did okay in camp from what I hear, but hey, next man up. He fits that bill. He's a big body. If he can take up a, a blocker or two, didn't they give him? A, they gave him a. Didn't they give him like a couple million guarantees? They, they gave him more money than you usually do give a an undrafted free agent, right. which means they really like him. So, hey, some like we like we see in that other team that we cover. Sometimes Maybe it was a when couple hundred thousand or something, whatever it was. I know it yeah. was two, two bills or something. Sometimes when you're given the opportunity based on injury, people rise up. So yeah. I um, mean, they need a giant run stuffer because the uh they get pushed back, those holes get opened up. And then we talked a little bit about this yesterday on the post game show. That wide nine is uh, uh you know, 
they had a wide nine on the on the tying touchdown, and and uh, you saw um, uh, Matt Stafford audibleize out of a pass and just do a do a draw to Williams, and it was wide open right up the middle. Uh, because they're very, they're very predictable on defense. Those holes are wide on the wide nine. When they get into, you know, passing uh, type plays, they're, those gaps are huge. All you got to yeah. do is do a trap or some th- kind of where you seal off that, that center guy and then you have somebody go after the linebacker and s- seal him off. It's boom. It's, it's a wide open lane. Dan, what are you, what are you seeing out of Nick Bosa right now? I'm seeing that it looks to me, I noticed this yesterday, I thought about this and I didn't bring it up. It, it looks like he was out there almost every play and that he's like, doesn't have much left at the end of the games. He looks which like when we need, which is when we need him the most. Yeah. He looks like he's pretty fresh the first half. He's getting in, he's putting some pressure on guys, but late in the game, he's not anywhere to be found. And I, I noticed, um, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, um, well, two years ago when he was defensive player of the year, you know, it was amazing. But I noticed they they didn't really rotate him in and out. And I don't know if it's because they're not the depth just isn't there. Yeah, the depth isn't isn't there. Um, what I see from Nick Bosa is when he first came in the league, he was a combination of power and speed. Mm-hmm. He used his speed a lot, and because he was a little lighter and a little less bulky as he is right. now he could beat you with a rip power move but he could also use speed dip the shoulders and get around you right i don't see that guy anymore i see a bigger guy a stronger guy that does one move every bull single rush. time and that's a bull rush exactly and you know when you're going up against 320 340 pound tackles that outweigh you by 60 or 70 pounds if they get lower and have technique like no matter how strong you are, they're stronger and they're bigger. It's not going to work. So I wish I wish Nick would maybe lose 10 pounds and get a little bit of that quickness and speed back. But he seems like a guy that's very prideful of his body and his physique. Yeah, his you brother notice, is you, actually lighter. Yeah, you notice you notice what Nick wears in press conferences uh, some of the times or in the locker room. He, yeah. he wants to let people know. Uh, you know, I would too, man. I'm not gonna lie. If I had arms like that, I'd be wearing sleeveless shirts too. But yeah, yeah. Nick, I, Nick, I think would be better as a, a combination of a speed and a power guy rather than yeah, he is now. So that's that's not helping. Uh, you know, I, I I thought Brock Purdy it was probably for based on played a who great he had game. had in the lineup. It might have been his best game ever. Played a great game. He was uh, 22 of 30. For what, 290 r- yards roughly, no interceptions, three six drops. Yeah, six drops. He could have been 28 of 30. Even if three of those were just dropped, he would have been 25 of 30 if only three of them were drops. And, and know, I love and I love that he scrambled, Dan. I love oh, that, that he so scrambled. Nice. I mean, God, he's got to understand, and so does Kyle. That when he plays like that, then the Niners are really hard to defend because they're going to play man to man with all those weapons. So if you got man to man and they're running around chasing these guys and the lanes are open, there's eight to 15 yards that are free yeah. yards every single time. So who I, I cares how you, to, who cares how you move the ball? Yeah. Move the ball. I, I think the Niners need to work on three or four things. And those three or four things are one is shore up the defense, got to get better against the run and get, the other thing on defense, I watched the Chiefs last night, and because they have such great co- corner covers, cover corners, corner covers, cover corners, because they have great cover corners, they blitz a lot. And right. the Niners, I don't recall seeing a blitz. If I did, I missed it uh, yesterday. And uh, The Niners don't got, blitz, Dan. That's why I said they're predictable. I know. It, it that's, drives that's me crazy. Not, that's you that's got, not in their game plan. I don't I don't get it. Because what's the one defense you, that bothers their offense? It's random blitz. blitzing, yep. press man to man, and you don't know where the blitz is coming from. Right. So what did you what is, lost? Yeah, what did you think common sense? Like, well, this bothers our offense. Why don't we do it? 
Yeah, but they don't. It, they they run the same defense almost every. They play. lost the Super Bowl because of a blitz on the final play. They yep. didn't. Ha- I mean, Ayuk was wide open there in the back of the end zone, and they didn't have time to get it to him. Not only he, not only that Super Bowl, the Super Bowl against the Ravens, they blitzed yeah. Kaepernick and forced him to throw an errant throw. They got away with defensive holding, but. You know, blitzes have screwed the Niners for big games for so yeah, many. Years, I don't know but, where but the blitz we don't is. Do it. I don't know where the blitz is with the Niners. We used to see it more when, uh, you know, we had Sala and um, D'Amico and, and D'Amico. But the last, I mean, Wilkes blitzed at the wrong time last year when it was, you know, yeah, that was just, you know, what God that that drives me crazy because like he got so scapegoated for yeah. that. And if you look at that play again. Tarverius Ward has got to intercept that ball. If he right. intercepts that ball, oh, it's a great call. And they got an interception, yeah. maybe even a pick six, but it went right through his hands. The guy got it and went the other way. Yeah, that's but true. But because of that one play, it's like, oh, we're never going to blitz again. I know. The, so the Niners need to blitz more. They need to shore up the run. Uh, they need a speedster on the outside. They, they, Ayuk looks like he's, uh, needs, to have like an oxygen mask on him in, when he's out there playing right now. He doesn't look in shape at all. Trent Williams is had to have an IV twice. You know, you think you'd learn from the Boza holdout how much, you know, uh, what, what the Niners did, it, it, they have no one to blame but themselves for right. letting those that thing drag out. And it right. could cost them the whole season. We'll see. I mean, there's still – what they still got 14 games to go, so it's still early. They've got plenty of time. They still have the most talent in the league. They they should be okay if they get healthy, but they are going to have to. I want to see them get a speedster Lose yes. as a receiver. And, it, might and, be, it might be Terrence Marshall. Yeah, Terrence Marshall should be playing. I don't know why Ronnie Bell even was on the flight home. Uh I mean, I'm saying that obviously facetiously, but look, it's time to move off of Ronnie Bell. You want to keep Ronnie Bell? Just wave him. No one's going to grab him. You can put him back on your practice squad, and he could work on the jugs machine, and he could start, you know, working on his hands because, you know, he's he gets open. He's not a guy that is going to get – he's not a deep threat, but you got to hang on to the ball if you're not a speedster. You know, you, you don't have the speed, but you got to catch the ball. So let's get uh, Marshall up on the team for for against the Patriots, and you know what, Debo's going to be sitting. And, run and if your he th- doesn't, if he doesn't know the whole playbook, who cares? Right. If he knows four or five concept routes and he's good at it, and he offers a dimension that the other receivers, quite frankly, doesn't, then bring him up. Don't worry yeah. about that. He doesn't know the whole playbook. I mean, yep. stop. Try to win that game. And move on to the next week. It's Absolutely. game by game. There's 17 chapters in this book. And right now, through three chapters, they don't look very good. So switch it up. Yep. All right, Los. That that should do it for us. Um, what do we got coming up here? It's uh we got it's Monday here. So we're recording this on Monday, and we should be able to have another Niner show later in the week. We'll uh, get Bora on here. We'll do some uh, picks f- as for the Niners later in the week. And, and we'll do our fantasy football. Yeah, Wednesday there you go. At seven. Wednesday night. Yeah. That's right. Wednesday at 7. We got uh, that uh, going on. And we shall uh, see you guys. Are we doing Wednesday at 7 or are we going to push that back? Let me see. Um, well, well, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll figure that out. But uh, – Guys, thanks for joining NorCal Sports. By the way, if you are watching this, NorCal Sports, there's a banner going across the bottom there. Uh, Secure Money, that's my company. I do business in California as Dan Cuccimillo Insurance Services. If you need help with any financial needs as far as, you know, you want to grow your money in the market, but you're, you have a little bit of your adverse uh, against your risk, you don't want to take the chance of losing your money, give me a call. I can show you how to gain money in the market without any risk of loss. That means if the market's 
lose 40, 50 percent like they did in 2008, you won't lose a penny, but you'll get you'll capture 60, 70 percent of the upside of the market. So that's huge. That is huge to be able to. Absolutely. So if you have 100 grand, for example, and you make uh, one year, you make 12 percent and you go up to 112,000 and the next year the market tanks, you still have 112,000 with the products that I can put you in. Okay. And your gains are locked in and you never go backwards. So give me a call. The phone number is scrolling right there at the bottom of the screen. It's a toll-free number, 888-960-SAFE. Like the stolen base, he's safe at third base. 960-SAFE, 888-960-SAFE or 7233. Give me a call. I'll show you how to grow your money safely. Also, if you're not in the need of growing your money and you just want to protect your your family and your loved ones, you need some life insurance, give me a call. I can get you the best rates because I'm a broker, so I can shop and find the very best rates for you. And the same with Lowe's. He's a broker too in the mortgage business. Uh, flex funding, rates are dropping. Lowe's rates are down to what right now? What can you Ooh, get? I, lo I, lo I locked somebody in on an FHA on Friday at 4.95. Woo! FHA loan. So, now that's with really great credit. I mean, credit does account for things. So, but compared to where rates were uh, about six months ago in the in the mid mid to high sevens, we are consistently in the fives right now. So, there's an opportunity to do something if you want to cash out some money from your house and roll it into Dan's. Um, then, boy, you got a double header between the two of us. Yeah. We both helped you out on that. So it's a good opportunity yeah. so, to uh, to lower your rate, lower your payment. I have a lot of different programs, not just the A paper stuff. So, yeah, shoot me a call, and uh, we'll go over your scenario together. Yeah, you, that's you it. Trust Nine, us, two, you trust us with our, yeah, you trust us with our sports takes and entertainment. Wait till you see what we can do on the business side of things. Yeah. So, yeah, give uh, Los a call at Flex Funding. He's at 925-250-4894. Again, 925-250-4894. If you forget the number, just scroll back to the very end of the show and you'll see the number scrolling at the bottom of the, uh, of the page here. Again, we thank you. And, guys, you know, we love sports. It's something that's a passion of ours, but uh, – we both love helping people and we've been doing it for over 20. What? How many years you got in the business, Lowe's? 26. Okay. I got 25 started in, well, 97. I actually got my first license, went on my own in 2000. So we're looking at about 52, 53 years combined between the two of us. Guys, we've helped a lot of people. Let us help you. So thanks for watching. We'll see you guys later. Um, take care. Have a great uh, rest of your day.